Good evening, everybody. Hope everybody's doing well. Sound like it's starting to rain outside. Hope you guys are doing well tonight. And I'm um, really looking forward to being with you for the next few minutes. Last week, uh, we were into Ephesians chapter 1. We were talking about our identity in Christ. And we're going to pick up there tonight and give people just a couple minutes to get on, and then we're going to get going. Hey, Karen and Ken, hope you guys are doing well. <laughs> I see people are starting to get on and uh, glad to have you tonight. Ken and Karen, especially thank you for Sunday. And I heard great things. I knew that I would. Um, but you guys are such a blessing. Ken, Ken brought the word Sunday. Uh, we were out of town. My family was out of town. I had an opportunity to uh, run down to Savannah and we took advantage of that, enjoyed that. And, uh, but now, I'm ready to be back home with my folks. Hey, Susan and Chuck, Lisa and Chris. How are you guys doing? Chuck, I hope you've had a better week lately. <laughs> you've had some rough weeks, man. That poison ivy and stuff. Good gracious, it got in your eye. Chris and Lisa, hope you guys are doing well. Hey, Jim. Jim Manus. Love you, brother. I appreciate you guys tuning in. I really do. It means a lot. And um, I noticed last week that I was very long-winded. That won't happen tonight. <laughs> I promise. I've got, a, uh, I've got a, a way to tell time right here beside me. My mother-in-law. Yo, <laughs> but I'm gonna. Um, I'm not gonna be long-winded tonight. Sarah, goodness, somebody from my youth group from a long time ago. Sarah and Larry. Sarah's all married now. Goodness. <laughs> Hope everybody's doing well. Hey, Madison. Hope you guys are doing good. <laughs> the Kalins are watching. All right, guys, grab your Bibles, if you haven't already, and turn to Ephesians chapter 1. And I want you to also uh, turn to 1 Peter chapter 1. There's some really good stuff. These two, um, just, I was actually just... Um, looking at some things in in first peter um yesterday by myself just some study time and and i started thinking man this will tie right in so i'm gonna bring up some um some of the points from first peter also um while we were um talking about ephesians last week we we're just talking about the church at ephesus uh paul was explaining to them that they were so rich in Christ. They were so wealthy in Christ. And in, their, um, in that wealth, even though they had all things available to them in Christ, it said that they were um, living, or Paul described them as living as beggars. And how sad that is to be wealthy, yet live as a beggar. How horrible that would be. Um, but don't we do that sometimes? Have you ever found yourself begging God to answer a prayer? I've done it. We've all been guilty of it. I believe, I believe we've all been guilty of that. And that happens when we um, let our awareness of our identity in Christ slip. Um, and we can't afford to do that. It's, it, it's like um, your access to your authority comes through your identity in Christ. There are certain places that uh, you may be employed there, but in order for you to take advantage of access, you have to wear your identification. There may be um, um, something on a card that you slide through or run through a scanner that allows you access. And even though you're an employee and have the authority to go there, if you don't wear your identification, you lose your ability to access what is already yours. 
Does that make sense? I think that's a pretty good way of putting it, actually. And in the kingdom of God, we are granted access to everything. He's actually given the keys to the kingdom. Uh, we have access to anything in Christ, but how many times do we live as beggars? How many times do we beg God? How many times do we just repetitively pray the same thing as if we say it enough times, he'll hear us? No, he hears us the first time, and it is his joy to grant the things that we need that he has for us. And uh, we uh, definitely have to learn the difference between what our wants are and what our needs are, and then trust God to make the greatest judgment of that because he is for us. He's always for us. He's never not for his children. He is for us. But my identity in Christ is so important, and I have to rely on that. I have to, to claim that so that I can actually live according to my condition in Christ um, and cor according to my citizenship in Christ and uh, what he's provided. I'm going to pick up in um, verse 3, Ephesians chapter 1. Verse three, and we may not even go as far as we went last week because I wanted to tie in that stuff from uh, First Peter. Hey, Kevin, my buddy from Florida. Hope everything's well down there. Love you, man. Um, First Peter, I'm sorry, Ephesians chapter one, verse three. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Nothing missing, nothing broken in Christ. It says it plainly right there. He's already blessed us with every spiritual blessing. So there's nothing that he's uh, withholding from us, but we have to access it. We do it through our identity in Christ so that we're not living as beggars. So we're not begging uh, something off of God that he's already got intended for us. Um, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Last week, we talked about that, about what it meant to uh, be holy in him. And uh, we discovered or talked about um, that to be holy in Christ is simply uh, to be set apart for him, to be set apart for his work in our life and to be without blame before him in love simply means that by the work that Jesus did, not the work that we've done. Don't ever mistake that. But because of the work that Jesus did on the cross of Calvary, shedding his blood for my sin, and we're gonna talk about that, how, how incredible that was. Now I am actually blameless, without blame. And that simply means this. It doesn't mean that I didn't ever do anything wrong. It actually means I did do things that were wrong. There are some things I did that were wrong called sin. Yet, I am free from the guilt of that sin. That's what it means to be blameless in Christ. You did it. Yeah, you did it. And the enemy wants to keep you right there. He wants to keep you in fro frozen in time of what you did. So he wants to make you to, uh, to always think of your guilt. Yeah, I was guilty, but now I have been forgiven by the blood of Jesus Christ. And because of that, I'm also free of the guilt that came with my past sins. I don't have to live under that. Who can live under that type of, of frustration? Uh, and, and I shared with you last week how, um, how I, I grew up kind of thinking that, um, you know, I didn't want to, I didn't want to talk about my flesh. I didn't want to get into my flesh. I didn't want people to know. I wanted to hide those things. It actually made me a professional hypocrite. Things that I could, I mean, think about what I just said there, a professional hypocrite hypocrite. I could hide all of my sin when I got around church people. I knew how to act the role, how to act the part. I carried my Bible. I talked right. I watched my P's and Q's in front of the people at church, but mainly because I was afraid. I didn't want people to know that I was struggling to live this life when it's not God's will for us to struggle to, 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 to um, walk the Christian walk. And it's definitely not his will for us to be what I just called a professional hypocrite. How lousy is that to uh, be good at, at disguise and hiding? And, and here's what happens. Um, where we're weak in our walk with the Lord, we don't want to talk about it. And we definitely don't want anybody to call us on it. 
And that's where um, religion uh, accommodates that so well because religion says, I can't show you my weakness, so I'll show you my work. As if our work has something to do with it. Our works have nothing to do with uh, the redemption of Jesus. What, what Jesus did is the work that we cling to because if, if, if it were possible for my works uh, to save me, then Jesus died in vain. And he did not die in vain. He paid all of the price. So he says this, he chose us in him before the foundation of, world, of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him. him in, <clears throat> excuse me. My mouth forgot how to talk. Before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. And just like we talked about last week, that was just because he wanted to. Um, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence. Uh, we got to verse seven, I believe it was last week. So we're gonna pick up at verse eight, which he made to abound to us toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, there again, said it in verse um, five, according to the good pleasure of his will, again in verse nine, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself. In other words, just because he wanted to, that is a picture of the goodness of God, that in the dispensation, dispensation of the fullness of the times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. Okay, that's as far as I believe I'm gonna go in Ephesians as far as reading tonight. Hey, Tanya, Tanya, my childhood friend. Hope you guys are doing well. Love you guys. Join on in with us. Hey, now flip over to um, 1 Peter chapter one because I wanna tie this in. Um, so our identity it is so huge in Christ. And, and I've said this over and over again. The enemy... Uh, he knows about your identity. He just thinks that you don't know. And he will challenge you on it constantly. And I said this about our past sins. The enemy calls, he knows my name, yet he calls me by my sin. He calls me by the latest thing that I tripped over. He calls me by sins uh, from way back that he just attached that, even though it happened, even though I did it, even though I, it was my responsibility, once Jesus has saved me, that burden is lifted from me, yet the enemy will still call me by my past sin, even though he knows my name. But the good thing about God, even though he knows my sin, he calls me by my name. So the enemy knows my name, but won't call me by my name, he'll call me by my sin. Jesus knows my sin, yet he calls me by my name. What an incredible piece uh, of help for my identity in him. You notice over and over, he always called his, uh, his disciples by their name and that empowered them. He could, have, he could have read their mail. He could have told them what they were doing wrong. And he did tell them what they were doing wrong, but he did not name them as, um, as applying that uh, sin to them as a person who will now be identified by a sin. He always wanted them to be identified by their name, and that's important. So um, 1 Peter chapter 1, and um, I think if I'm actually, yeah, I want to use a different Bible for that. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13. So we just read first uh, Ephesians chapter 1. Um, now we're going to look at, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13. I'm excited about this. I'm nervous because of, of time, and I know I shouldn't be. Um, but last week I was so long-winded that I wanted to cut it back this week, so I'm trying to be aware of that. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13. Therefore, be, uh, prepare your minds for action. Be self-controlled. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. So even right here, um, leading up to all of this, I told you we were trying to get into Ephesians chapter one. And, uh, but before we got there, we were in Romans chapter 12, verse two. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you can um, 
proof what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed. And it, so it's still, it's talking about the mind. So this is something that constantly has to, that's a whole different chapter. That's way back in Romans. So all the way down to 1 Peter would be in mind again. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. This is not a passive thing. Christianity is not a passive thing. It's not, it, is, it is not at all. It's not where you get saved and then you kick back and lay back in your chair and, and, and soak in the rays of God. Hey, all that stuff is good, but he is wanting us to prepare for action. So therefore, prepare your minds for action. That's part of renewing my mind. Renewing my mind is not just trying to wash out all of the... Um, the, the things that, the thoughts that, that aren't becoming for a Christian. It's not just um, uh, washing out um, any temptation that might be in my, my mind. It's actually taking part in my mind and actively, actively trusting in the fact of what my identity in Christ is and what Jesus did for me. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. So we're actively involved in this. Be self-controlled, self-controlled, control yourself. It's that simple. You can do it. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. Listen to how this, this chapter, this part of this chapter re mimics um, Ephesians. They're not saying these things over and over again to be wordy. They're saying them over and over again so you get this. This is part of your identity in Christ. But it's not just saying, it's not just wearing the badge. It's being the badge. In Ephesians, it says that we have these things. We have an inheritance that we be. Okay? So it's, it's not that we think of inheritance as something that you get. But in the kingdom, inheritance in Jesus Christ is something that you become. It's something that you are. It's something that you're actively doing. Okay? So <clears throat> as obedient... As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. That word ignorance can also be translated to darkness. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. Be separated unto God in everything you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Since you call on the Father who judges each man's work impartially live your lives as strangers here in reverent fear for you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed get that nothing perishable the, the, the price for you was not paid with anything perishable even something as costly as silver and gold you were not redeemed with that from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers. But this is what you were redeemed with, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. So do you see how powerful that is right there? If you would have been redeemed with something that perishes, in time your redemption would perish, just like what you paid for. The value would have been worn out. It would, it would, the shelf life would have been uh, called. It, it'd be like uh, the bank calling you on your note saying, we demand full payment now. That like what you did was good enough for a little while, but now we demand full payment. But see, the kingdom of God was like that too. See, there were sacrifices that were required, but they were animal sacrifices. But here's the thing. The blood of bulls and goats and rams they could not pay the full price for our sins. They could simply hold back the wrath of God <clears throat> from one year to the next. That was the shelf life of the thing. From one year to the next. It had a one year shelf life. It had to kill. There had to be blood that was shed. It was the rule. It's the way God set it up. There had to be blood that was shed. But thankfully, Jesus became the perfect sacrifice and he played with he paid the price for our sins with, with precious blood that was imperishable. In other words, it will last forever. That one price, he paid, thank you, Lord. He paid the price for our sins. 
and it paid it for the whole time for all of eternity. That's how good God is. And that's how good your salvation is. And that's what you've got to hold on to with all of your heart, with all of your mind, with all of your soul, with all of your strength. You hold on to the fact that it was precious blood, the blood of Jesus that paid for uh, the, the sacrificial lamb of God. He paid the price. He paid my price. Man, I was expensive and you were expensive, but he paid it and it's done. And I thank him for it. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. He was chosen before the creation of the world. What did Ephesians say? You were chosen before the creation of the world. You know what it means when it says that you're a joint heir with Jesus? It means what Jesus had coming to him, you've got coming to you. That's a wonderful thing. You were chosen before the creation of the world. It says that plainly right there in the beginning of Ephesians. And right here, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 20. Jesus was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him, you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him, and so your faith and hope are in God. We're going to be having a baptism service here soon. And, and what that baptism simply represents, it's simple obedience unto, unto God to be baptized. And it's a first work in him that when we come to him, it, it is something that we do that symbolizes our death, our death to our sins, that, and the, that we go under the water, that, that uh, is representative of us dying to our flesh. And then when we come out of the water, it's being raised to a newness of life. And it's just making that statement. And I'm so excited that we're gonna be doing that very soon, check out our website. The information is about is there um, about the dates and the times and where we're going to be having that. And um, if you'd like to take part in that, just let us know because I would love for you to take part. Uh, baptism is such a wonderful thing. So, but it says it's through him, through Jesus, you believe in God who raised him from the dead and glorified him. And so your faith are in God. Now, now this is where I'm going to finish up on. But, but you've got to get this. This is so powerful. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for your brothers, love one another deeply from the heart. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. Hallelujah. Love each other. Now that you have sincere love, love each other deeply. That is actually um, repeated, I think, in chapter 4, verse 8. Yep. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, it talks about if you speak with the tongues of men and angels, but you don't have love. It, it doesn't mean anything. It's a sounding gong. It's a, it's a clanging symbol. Uh, symbol. So, so, but, but this is what I want you to get out of that. And this is so, um, so on time for where we are at right now in history. Listen, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22. Man, this is such a powerful verse. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, so you have come into position and you're pure before God. You purified yourself um, by obeying the truth. That's what it simply comes down to, simple obedience. That's the reason everybody doesn't have this because everybody won't obey. But if you'll obey, you'll get the correct outcome. See, everybody wants the outcome, but everybody's not willing to pay the price. And the price and, and, and the cost to play is simply obeying what he said. That's the price of admission right there. That, that's all it costs you right there is simple obedience. But that's not, that's not the point that I want you to get. I want you to follow on. The same verse, 22. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for your brothers, love one another deeply from the heart. This is huge. He's not just saying, hey, love everybody. No, he's saying, now that you have sincere love through obeying the truth. Oh, through obeying the truth, you now have sincere love. So the sincere love that you have 
comes from obeying the truth of God's word. So that with that sincere love for your brothers, love one another deeply from the heart. Okay? I'm going to explain that. And this is, this, this, this is where obedience is going to come in. And, and, and this is, is what, um, where the rubber actually meets the road. When I say it, you're going to get it. If you had not got it yet, I promise you're going to get it. This is the, the best point that I'm going to make all night. I told you the Lord showed me this yesterday morning whenever I was reading through this. I was not planning to use this at all. Matter of fact, I was going to, I was going to study more in Ephesians, and I turned to this, and I started reading First Peter. I think I actually started in chapter 4, and I started reading. I'm like, well, I'm just going to read all the way through. And, I'm, and, and then by the time I got all the way through the book of Peter, I was like, well, I'm going to start at the beginning, First Peter. And I read all the way through, and, and I, when I got to this, I just started making notes in my phone, and it was simply this. I'm going to read it one more time. Verse 22, now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for your brothers, love one another deeply from the heart. That is so applicable to right now, okay? Yes, we cannot have the sincere love until we obey. Obedience opens the door. It unlocks the door for sincere love. But I want you to get this picture. Now that you have sincere love, so picture that as a gift from God. Receive by obeying. You've been obedient. Now you've got this love weapon that actually is going to be used as <laughs> to, to love someone. That's your weapon right now, a weapon of love. It's actually a weapon of peace. But okay, so you have love. Now what does he say to do with it? Love one another deeply. I, I promise it's going to get better. So he's given us love. And what does he say to do with it? Take the love and love. Now, now, just please stay with me. Here, this is so big. This is so huge. If you don't, if you, it, it, because obedience has to run its full course right here, he's given you the love. Now he expects you to take the love and use it. It's that simple, but it's bigger than that because a process has to change. Something has to change because once he's opened up the door or you've, you've actually opened up the door, you've stuck the key in with obedience, you've opened up the door and now your gift is sincere love. That sincere love is in the noun form. There it is right there. Love is just in the noun form. A person, place, or thing. Love, a, a noun is a person, place, or thing. But we've got to get it from noun form to, get to, to fulfill all of the obedience that God has intended for us to, to obey him fully. We've got to take the word love in its noun form and change it into the verb form. There it is right there. The verb form. Verb is action. What did he say? Let, let, let me go back to, to the therefore. Verse 13, prepare your minds for action. There it is right there. Prepare your minds for action. What is the action going to be? Action to love. To love. To love in obedience. Your love can't just be a thing. Your love cannot just stay in noun form or it's just there. It's just, it's just there. It's not accomplishing anything when it's in noun form. But when you let it go to verb form and you use that to love other people, now you're getting it. I can tell you're getting it. You're getting it. Now you are fulfilling the full obedience of what his word is. So let me read that one more time. I got so excited I lost my place. But there it is right there. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love, noun form, for your brothers, verb form, love one another deeply from the heart. There it is right there. <laughs> 
go from the thing of love to the action of love. That's it, Dionya. You got it. I love it too. God, you're so good, and I thank you, Lord. I thank you for your mighty hand. I thank you for the wisdom of your word. I thank you that it's there for us. It's there for the taking. It's there for the doing. So, Lord, we receive from you. What shall we do for all that you've done for us? We take what you've given us. We will take the love, the sincere love, but we will not keep it in noun form. We will complete the, the and, and completely obey your word. We will fulfill the obedience by taking the sincere love and now using it, loving deeply from our heart. Our heart is cleansed through obedience. So with this pure heart, God, what can come out of a pure heart except pure love, your love? And we're so grateful for that. Help us do it. We're going to do it in the name of Jesus. God, if our world could catch on to that right there and obey what your word says, we would be changed instantly, instantly. Thank you for your word. You're so good. I'm excited about your word. And I love you, Lord. And we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, God bless you guys. God bless you guys. Teach us how to love, Lord. Amen, Susan. Teach us how to love. He's going to do it right from the heart through obeying his word. There it is. The directions are simple. They're actually simple. He does not make it. He makes things uh, that are simply profound. He'll make them profoundly simple for us. Love you guys. Hey, God bless you guys. And God's going to help us. He always does. God, thank you. We love you, Lord. God bless you guys. Look forward to meeting with you next week. Hey, if you don't have a church to go to, like and share this video. Show it to some of your friends. Maybe they'll want to be a part Sunday, 11 o'clock, um, 1705 Highway 21 in Fort Mill, South Carolina, Christ Fellowship Church. We love you guys. God bless you. Have a great week.